the amount of uncertainty uh, you know that 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 humans face day to day far eclipses the amount of risk that they face. Volatility is a risk. It is not an uncertainty. Bitcoin maximizes the price risk so that we can minimize the monetary policy uncertainty. Hi everyone, I'm Giovanni and today I have the pleasure to be joined by Pierre Rochard, Bitcoin advisor, co-founder of the Satoshi Nakamoto Institute and currently Bitcoin strategist at Kraken. Thanks for being with us, Pierre. Yeah, sure thing. Thanks for having me. You joined Kraken in October last year as the exchange's Bitcoin strategist, or as often reported in the press, Bitcoin evangelist. So why does Kraken need a Bitcoin evangelist? Yeah, so uh, it, it started out as kind of tongue in cheek because uh, people describe Bitcoin as a religion. So I thought it would be funny to title myself that. Um, but uh, ultimately, I, th I think that not everyone shares my sense of humor. So uh, I switched it to Bitcoin strategist which is a little more serious and also just more accurate as to what I'm doing day to day here. And the reason that a cryptocurrency exchange uh, needs a Bitcoin strategist is that the mission is the adoption of cryptocurrency. Uh, and so from that perspective, figuring out, OK, what is the most effective way of getting the adoption of cryptocurrency to happen and to grow the ecosystem and to ultimately you know, grow the market size for an exchange like Kraken, uh, you need to have someone who, who is focused on, on that. Would you define yourself as a Bitcoin maximalist? Uh, no, I'm a Bitcoin minimalist. So uh, from my perspective, uh, the, the goal of Bitcoin is really about uh, how, how do we have a system with constraints such that it is able to remain decentralized. And that is actually the, the, the biggest challenge, I think, in this space and why uh, scaling has been such an acrimonious and, uh, you know, uh, large debate. Uh, so from that perspective, it's not so much about, OK, how can we, uh, you know, put everything into the Bitcoin protocol and how can we, you know, that's kind of the maximalist position of how do we get everything into Bitcoin. Um, my view is how do we get as little as possible into Bitcoin? And so really we want to be focused on uh, what are Bitcoin's assurances, right? Being permissionless, being censorship resistant, being seizure resistant, and having a sound monetary policy. And all of those enforced by the peer-to-peer -peer network of nodes and, and then, of course, the proof of work mining on top of that. So when, when we're trying to think about uh, how to scale Bitcoin and you know, let's say maximize its utility, right? Maximize its efficiency. We're really trying to minimize the footprint, right? Which is the cost on one side and then the benefit on the other side. Uh, and so uh, I think that the, the maximalist label doesn't really apply to me from, from, from there. I, you know, I, I don't think that um, financial intermediation uh, necessarily can be trust minimized or trustless in the same way that Bitcoin is. Uh, you know, when you're lending money to someone or you're investing in their business, ultimately you do have to trust them. It doesn't actually matter if the contract that you are uh, engaging in is going to have its execution be automated in a blockchain. Um, you know, that's, that's just an operational back office efficiency from a database perspective. It's kind of a technical implementation detail. Ultimately, you're still trusting them, right? You're still trusting them to perform. Uh, and you're still trusting them to provide a return on your investment. And so there, I, I, I actually see a very minimal role for the technology, uh, you know, on the financial intermediation layer. And I think that, you know, the financial intermediation is going to continue to be a, a, uh, a, a, a essentially a, a, a trusted third party service because it doesn't scale otherwise. Otherwise, you have to be managing your own credit portfolio. And, you know, people throughout history have always outsourced that, that performance of uh, credit due diligence and, and credit, um, you know, uh, servicing to other third parties. And I think that'll continue to be the case. Okay, so we have a lot of uh, meat on the fire for this because you, you mentioned a lot of uh, interesting things. Uh, the first thing that I want to clarify is uh, when you say that you want the, as minimum as possible to be added into Bitcoin, that sounds like being a Bitcoin conservative, like someone who thinks that already Bitcoin is uh, 
uh, perfect as it is? Uh, so I, I think that that would be kind of a normative approach of like uh, me wanting that to be the case, right? Um, but I think that I, I see it as more of a positive approach of me accepting that that is the case, right? So because Bitcoin is decentralized, it would actually be very difficult to expand its scope uh, and it, expanding its scope actually from a technical perspective requires doing a hard fork and knocking people off the network. Whereas reducing its scope is a uh, soft fork and is, is backwards and forwards compatible. Uh, and so that allows you to continue to increase Bitcoin's utility without uh, excluding people from the network. And I think that the inclusive approach of hey, let's, let's try to have a protocol that is very stable and, and does not exclude others uh, is, is a uh, better approach um, than, than constantly trying to hard fork it. I'm asking you that because uh, I, I was reading the website of the Satoshi Nakamoto Institute, uh, which you founded, which says that Bitcoin is not the beginning nor is the end. So that means that you imply that there should be some sort of evolution in the way Bitcoin works. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, if we look at the history of the Bitcoin protocol, we've seen a number of very successful hard forks uh, occur. Uh, the, the, the biggest one and the latest one uh, was SegWit. But I think that there will be more. Uh, you know, just on the immediate roadmap, uh, we have Taproot, which is a big change in Bitcoin's uh, scripting language. And so it's, I think that, you know, if you constrain the design space uh, to things that are forward and backward compatible, then uh, yes, it does limit what you're going to be able to do. But I think that it's a wild exaggeration to say that that causes protocol ossification, right, of, okay, now we can no longer change anything. Um, I, I don't think that's true from an engineering perspective. And it's certainly not true from a historical perspective. So, for example, there have been uh, other soft forks like uh, check sequence verify, check block time verify, uh, that th these, and, and then obviously SegWit, these uh, protocol e evolutions over the past decade have enabled layer two solutions. And so now we're seeing Lightning be increasingly uh, looked at as a, uh, the future of Bitcoin. So I think that. Um, you know, I, I do agree that on the Nakamoto Institute, we need to write more about this. Uh, uh, but uh, it's certainly uh, the case that Bitcoin is continuing to move forward. You criticize the core definition of money based on the three main functions, store of value, medium of exchange and unit of account. So what's wrong with that definition? Yeah, so, um, I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a fine uh, first attempt at a definition uh, of money. But ultimately, I think that uh, the, the issue with it is that it's not looking at it from the, first of all, the subjectivist point of view, right? So uh, the subjectivism is maybe less popular in other schools of thought, but it's a, it's a central piece of Austrian economics. So once you start looking at monetary phenomenon, you have to look at it from the perspective of individuals acting in the economy. So why is it that individuals, uh, you know, use money? Why do they hold, hold cash balances, right? Um, and what it comes down to is a dichotomy between the concept of risk and uncertainty. And uh, this is not exclusive to the Austrian school. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, Keynesians and neoclassical economists have written about this as well. And I think that they largely agree on the framework. They just disagree on the implications from a public policy perspective and, and then from like a normative, uh, what should a monetary system look like? Um, but in any case, uh, risk is, um, is, is quantifiable, right? So you're able to attach a, um, a probability to a certain uh, set of outcomes, uh, a known set of outcomes. And so that's what, uh, you know, actuaries do. And that's what insurance is for. So. Um, in, in the perfect world, if we only had risk and we, so we were able to quantify all of the future outcomes and, and the known set of outcomes, um, then we would actually be able to not hold any cash. All we would have to do is enter into insurance contracts uh, for various uh, contingencies and uh, you know, money would actually just not even really be a thing in our economy. It's hard for us to conceive of because that's not what 
that's not the reality we live in. The reality we live in is just filled with uncertainty. And in fact, the amount of uncertainty uh, you know, that, that, that humans face day to day far eclipses the amount of risk that they face. Uh, and so the, the number of insurable risks that uh, exist in the economy or you know, in life, let's say, it's not just economic, the amount of risk that we face is actually very, very small. Um, and so the, the trend we've actually seen is that uh, governments uh, tr transform uncertainty into risk. Now, we, we can endlessly debate about whether that's good or bad. I, don't, I won't get into it because it's kind of a political question. But from a monetary economics perspective, the reason we hold cash is to hedge future uncertain cash flows. So when we think about uncertain future cash flows, it's not necessarily the case that we're only thinking about them in a negative sense, right, of, okay, we're concerned about, uh, you know, are we going to have unforeseen losses, right? So is my, is, you know, um, am I going to lose my job, right? That, that would be an uncertain future cash flow. Or will I be able to sell my product? That would be an uncertain future cash flow for business. Uh, and so that negative side, like we've, we've seen it with the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, which impacted some businesses severely uh, and, and dramatically cut their revenues. Uh, now, there's some debate about whether pandemics are risk or uncertainty, uh, but I think they're, they're certainly a mixture of both. Uh, and so there's, there's the negative side, but there's also the positive side of not knowing when you know, are you going to have interesting investment opportunities, for example. And so you don't never know what is going to come across your table as an investor. And that's why investors have to hold some amount of cash because they don't know uh, what the future opportunity space is going to be like. Uh, and that's a fundamental uncertainty. There's, not, there's no way you could insure yourself against the possibility of having uh, you know, your brother-in-law present uh, his, his great new business plan for his restaurant. <laughs> What's the role played by Bitcoin in, uh, in this uncertainty uh, framework? Yeah, so ultimately, when you're thinking about how to hedge anything, um, the, the hedging asset, you want it to be the diametric opposite of what is being hedged. Right. So if you're hedging against uncertainty, you want to hold the least uncertain asset possible. And so my argument is that if you look across the different uh, sources of uncertainty in a monetary system, Bitcoin is actually the least uncertain monetary asset in existence today. And so that's why I think that if we uh, look at money from this framework, it actually makes it much more understandable why Bitcoin is interesting. Now, people will, uh, you know, react to that and say, well, no, hold on, the volatility, right? There's too much volatility. Volatility is a risk. It is not an uncertainty. And so you can actually insure yourself against volatility by buying puts or by selling futures. And that is what is going to allow you to use uh, Bitcoin's uncertainty minimizing properties, right, and hold Bitcoin while... Uh, hedging your downside risk of the price going down uh, far more than, than you want over a certain time frame. Okay, I agree, I agree with you that the volatility can be hedged, but what about uncertainty? What does it make Bitcoin so little uncertain? Yeah, so if we think about the monetary system and how we interact with it, there's, I see four different key parts. The first one is, are we actually able to even access it, right? So this is, uh, you know, the ability to just receive money, receive the cash. And this is, I think, an area where Bitcoin really shines is the permissionless nature of it. Anyone can generate a private key, derive a public key, you know, encode it into an address and receive Bitcoin. So from that perspective, I think that there's not now contrast with, uh, you know, any other monetary system. Uh, already, I think Bitcoin exceeds their properties. So, for example, gold, uh, you're going to have to be able to uh, send it through the, uh, the mail, you know, the postal service. You're going to receive some mail uh, with some gold nuggets in it. Uh, and then same thing with cash, right? You'd have to put cash in the mail to do that. Um, or you get a bank account. Bank accounts are not permissionless. Uh, and so you do have to get permission 
whether it's from the financial institution or from the government or some combination of both. Um, so um, already, whether from an access perspective of being able to receive the monetary asset, I think that it's clear that Bitcoin has less uncertainty than the alternatives. You're basically saying that uh, somebody, something that is uh, permissioned is, uh, un is more uncertain than something that is permissionless. Oh, just by definition, right? Because other, 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 otherwise, you, you know, and it doesn't even necessarily have to be that the, the government or the bank um, has flagged you as, as being a bad person. It could just be by accident, right? Or, or by a business decision that they've decided not to bank you. So it's not, or, uh, you know, it's not the postal service that refuses to mail your gold. It's that your mail could get lost in the post service um, or, okay. or an employee steals it. You know, there's, there's all sorts of contingencies there that are uncertainties, not risks. Um, and so for, 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 you know, if you contrast it with how the Bitcoin system works, there's just a lot less uncertainty there. Uh, so the second property is the seizure resistance. And so this has to do with, okay, once you have received the cash and it is on your balance sheet, what is the cost of someone else seizing it? So nothing is ever seizure proof, right? And there's no such thing as being seizure proof, but you can have seizure resistance in the sense that the cost of seizing this monetary asset is greater than the cost of seizing any other asset. And so that's where, you know, you, you, you look at hardware wallets, you look at multi-sig, um, these are all solutions that are increasing Bitcoin seizure resistance. Now, contrast it with, you know, a bank account. Obviously, that's not seizure resistance at all. Those get seized all the time. Um, cash gets seized. Uh, you know, we hear stories about people at the border. You know, they got $10,000 in cash. It gets seized. Uh, they don't even have legal protection for it, right? That's uh, in the United States, uh, civil asset forfeiture. Uh, and so uh, there's even a lack of due processing. Uh, gold, same issue, right? You hear about people trying to smuggle gold across borders. Um, so it, Bitcoin is just, now we can debate about different scenarios, right? Like, but the, the bottom line is that if you look at the, the, the expected cost of seizing Bitcoin, it's just greater than the expected cost of seizing uh, gold or uh, physical cash, or it's especially a bank account. Like this bank account is like the most seizable thing ever. It gets seized all the time. So actually, I wanted to actually ask you about this. So is Bitcoin really unseizable? Because at the end of the day, right now, most of Bitcoin is uh, held in centralized uh, financial institutions like uh, centralized exchanges, like Kraken itself. So these centralized entities can be cracked down by governments, uh, theoretically. So in this case, uh, the government can actually seize your Bitcoin. Yeah, that's correct. So if you think about um, when you go to a, uh, a jewelry store or, you know, you're going to go buy a watch, you know, so some watches are waterproof, which means that you can go diving with them, right? Other watches are water resistant, which means that they can get a little bit of splashing on them. There's a certain cost to getting them wet, right? It, it, you've you got to dive you know, into the water, uh, but uh, then you've got other watches that are not water resistant at all. And if you even get a drop of water on it, it stops working or it starts rusting or whatever. So the way to think about it is that um, Bitcoin is not seizure proof, right? So there's always a way to seize Bitcoin and we've seen it happen. We saw it happen you know, in the case of the Silk Road with Ross Ulbricht, how did it get seized? He left his laptop open and the FBI or the, the DEA agents were able to, to access his Bitcoin while it's, uh, you know, just on his laptop because they were open. Uh, if he had closed his laptop and it had been on an encrypted hard drive, well, now the cost, you know, it, the, the cost would have been much greater, right? They would have had to crack the hard drive, uh, the hard drive's encryption. So it's not so much thinking about it from like, okay, is it seizure proof? It's more about, uh, uh, you know, when you're running away from a bear, you just need to be faster than the next guy, right? You just need to have a higher cost of seizing it than the next asset. And then it, from that point on, you can say Bitcoin is less uncertain than, than, than that asset. The third point is the censorship resistance. So again here, it's not about uh, being censorship proof, right? Nothing is censorship proof. It's about the cost of censoring Bitcoin transactions. So the cost of 
preventing someone from sending their Bitcoin to someone else, um, what, what is that? And so if you look at the Bitcoin system, the censorship resistance actually comes from the ability, first of all, to broadcast a transaction. So there's a number of different ways of broadcasting a transaction. You could do it over the normal internet. You could do it over Tor. You can do it over a shortwave radio. Uh, you could even do it, you know, by mail. If you mail someone, uh, if you print out a Bitcoin transaction and you mail it to someone, they could they could uh, broadcast it. So uh, there's all sorts of different creative ways of doing that because it's actually very little data uh, if you look at how much data a transaction takes up. And so then from the point that you broadcasted it and then it gets to the miner, then it's about getting the transaction into a block. And this is where Bitcoin's game theory really comes in to play and really shines, is that you have a prisoner's dilemma between the miners where, uh, so, you know, if a miner wants to exclude a transaction, they are going to forego the transaction fee revenue that they would get from including that transaction, from mining it, from including it in a block. Uh, and instead, the next miner who actually does include it in a block uh, will will get the transaction fee. And so miners are always competing against each other. Mining pools are competing against each other to include, you know, transaction fees into the blocks and in order to make money, uh, you know, as, as, as mining pools or as miners. Um, so that's, that's where the Bitcoin censorship resistance comes from. The, the fourth one is Bitcoin's monetary policy. So when we think about, you know, uncertainty in a monetary system, fiat actually maximizes the uncertainty of the monetary policy. And so you'll hear central bankers say things like, we will print as much, we will create as many monetary units as we want to, right? So they, they are establishing not, they're, they're, they're establishing that they're going to have maximum uncertainty in terms of their monetary policy. Why do they do that? They do that because they are trading that monetary policy uncertainty to minimize the price risk of their currency, right? They are trying to maximize the price stability of the monetary unit at the expense of the monetary policy uncertainty. Bitcoin does the opposite. Bitcoin maximizes the price risk so that we can minimize the monetary policy uncertainty. Now, different schools of thought are going to disagree on, you know, which approach is better. I think the market will decide. And, you know, I think that if, if the market is able to hedge the price risk, then actually, you know, there is a, there, there's a cost associated with hedging. Obviously, you got to pay the, the, uh, the, the cost of the futures contract or the cost of buying a put. Um, but ultimately, is that cost greater than the cost of maximizing monetary policy uncertainty uh, for, for fiat? Um, gold is actually still pretty competitive on monetary policy uncertainty uh, because there's a, there's a cost associated with mining gold. Um, but nevertheless, there has been uncertainty in gold supply in the past, right? So for example, when the new world was discovered, uh, and gold imports to Europe dramatically increased, that was uncertainty. Uh, same thing, for example, if we did asteroid mining and we brought back an asteroid with a massive amount of gold, that's uncertainty. Um, and so Bitcoin, you know, with the halvings, with the difficulty adjustments, it really has the least uncertain monetary policy. On the other hand, um, other monetary assets like the US dollar has an history much bigger than the one of Bitcoin. At the end of the day, I think the, the level of uncertainty that doesn't depend also on the period of time the specific monetary system has been battle tested. Like Bitcoin has 10, 10 years of life, the dollar has far more. Don't you think that it, the, also the time has some, uh, some influence on the level of, of uncertainty uh, to calculate the uncertainty? Well, so you're only going to calculate risk, right? So risk is what's quantifiable. The, and I agree that uh, the dollar's lifespan certainly reduces its risk from a purchasing power perspective. But from an institutional uncertainty perspective, I actually don't think that its lifespan has any effect on that because it has transformed so much over its life, right? And it actually, if you look at the history of the dollar, it's, it, it is a series of reminders of why the dollar is uncertain, right? It started out where the dollar represented a fixed amount of gold. 
And today, the dollar represents nothing, right? <laughs> so uh, it, it represents the credibility of the Federal Reserve. Thanks for being with us uh, today, Pierre. That was cool. Yeah, sure thing. Thanks for having me. That was Pierre Rochard, Bitcoin strategist at Kraken. As always, if you enjoyed this interview, smash the like button and subscribe to our channel. Cointelegraph. Like, subscribe and hodl.